Hello, my name is Todd Jackson, and I would like to welcome you to this month's travelogue, where I will be discussing my trip to the Missouri State Penitentiary. On October 3rd, 2021, a few friends and I journeyed to Jefferson City, Missouri for a ghost and history tour of the old prison. To say that this building is monstrous is an understatement, as one of its nicknames is The Wall. For not only are the exterior walls themselves massive, once you get inside the complex, it is a vast, seemingly endless array of buildings and passageways. This prison has a long, complex, and interesting history, and it was the oldest continuously operated prison in the United States until its closure in 2004. And it was known for being one of the most violent prisons in the United States, earning the notorious distinction as being the bloodiest 47 acres in America. In the early 1830s, Jefferson City was striving towards becoming the capital of Missouri, and one way to ensure that was to establish a prison, which became a priority for Governor John Miller, and construction began in 1834. The first male inmate was Wilson Edison from Greene County, Missouri, who arrived in 1836, and the first female inmate, Amelia Eddy, arrived in 1842. Wilson was convicted of stealing a $39 watch to which he was sentenced to two years, one month, and 15 days. Amelia Eddy from St. Louis was sentenced to two years in 1842 for grand larceny, but was released after only two days due to a lack of adequate facilities. Prison labor was very common during this time, and by 1885, there were six shoe factories and the, and the largest output of saddles in the entire world. The use of inmate labor was viewed as a critical part of the rehabilitation process, as the long hours would provide sufficient time to contemplate their sins. Becoming a sizable commercial hub, prison shops at one time produced shoes, saddle trees, twine, and clothing. Factory owners lived in opulent homes leading to the prison themselves, built using convict labor. This forced labor market created resentment and efforts to sabotage shops were frequent. In 1911, inmates housed at the prison saved thousands of documents from the state capitol after the dome was struck by lightning, which occurred on February 5th of that year. The ensuing fire sadly completely destroyed the capital. These two pictures show where today uh, tourists enter the facility, but when this was a functioning prison, this was a control bubble where the guards could uh, open and close doors within this area. Two things I would like to point out here are the dreary colors and the lighting. This prison was designed to make inmates feel inferior, and in just the brief amount of time that my colleagues and I visited, all of us commented on how uncomfortable we There have been many famous inmates at Missouri State Penitentiary, and the next two slides will discuss a few. Katie Richards O'Hare was a social reformer who was incarcerated at Missouri State Penitentiary in 1919 after being convicted under the Espionage Act of 1918. O'Hare was a leading socialist advocate who voiced strong opposition against conscription for World War I, which was against the Sedition Act of 1918, as she was publicly expressing a negative opinion of the war effort. O'Hare penned letters to her husband, explicitly describing conditions for women prisoners which included not segregating ill prisoners from healthy ones, and only being allowed to bathe once a week using a communicable tub. O'Hare's husband published these letters, which resulted in improvements and in forms, including cleaning and painting various rooms, hot meals, and installing individual showers. Living and working conditions within the prison were deplorable, and she made it her life's work to change them, and ultimately, O'Hare was appointed assistant director within California's penal administration, and her efforts were copied by other states. O 
O'Hare befriended Emma Goldman, the notorious anarchist who was serving her own sentence for advocating anarchy and promoting birth control. Goldman has been cited as influential on the founding of Planned Parenthood and the American Civil Liberties Union, also commonly known as the ACLU. James Earl Ray was no stranger to penal systems and was sentenced to 20 years at the Missouri State Penitentiary for armed robbery in St. Louis. During this time, he attempted to escape at least twice and was noted for exercising in his cell to build up his strength for such escapes. On April 22, 1967, Ray escaped in a bread box being loaded onto a delivery truck. On April 3, 1968, James Earl Ray assassinated Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and fingerprints on the rifle were matched to those taken during Ray's time at Missouri State Penitentiary. James Earl Ray plead, pleaded guilty on March the 10th, 1969, and was sentenced to 99 years in the Tennessee Department of Corrections, where he escaped twice and was swiftly recaptured each time. He remained incarcerated until his death on April 23rd, 1998. Charles Pretty Boy Floyd was arrested after he and an accomplice robbed a payroll clerk, making off with $11,000 and after being arrested, arrived at the Missouri State Penitentiary on December 18, 1925, and being released on March the 7th, 1929. Floyd was contracted by underworld figures to free Frank Nash, an escaped bank robber being returned to prison. Ironically, Nash was killed during the exchange of gunfire, along with four other members, uh, four members of law enforcement, rather, escorting him. This became known as the Kansas City Massacre and made Floyd a federal target. Floyd would meet his end on October 20th, 1934, after a shootout with federal agents in Ohio. A recreation program was initiated in 1931 as part of reforming efforts, and this included softball, boxing, and football. By 1949, monthly boxing matches were taking place during the summer months and were always well attended with one famous inmate utilizing this program, who was the boxer, Sonny Liston, and he was serving five years for armed robbery. As his prison boxing record became known, a public campaign to release him was successful, and Liston was released in 1952, upon which he became a professional boxer and winning the National Heavyweight Championship in 1953. Robert Berdella was a serial killer from Kansas City who abducted, tortured, sexually assaulted, and murdered six gay men from the Kansas City area. Berdella also kept detailed notebooks and Polaroids of all of his victims. On April 4, 1988, one of Berdella's victims escaped and was able to summon help, whereupon further investigation, police discovered the notebooks and the Polaroid pictures, sealing Berdella's fate. Bradella was sentenced to two life terms without the possibility of parole, and his notebooks and pictures remain in the possession of the Kansas City Police Department to this very day. Bradella wrote letters to a minister complaining that prison officials were denying him his heart medication, and he died of a heart attack in 1992. The Missouri State Penitentiary has a connection with popular culture in that the famous actress Cynthia Nixon of Sex and the City fame. In 1843, Martha Casto was sentenced to five years for murdering her husband with an axe and was the only inmate incarcerated there at this time, with prisoners complaining of being randomly whipped by guards and no heating allowed during the winter months due to fears of fires being started. Many women told of being assaulted, and Martha Casto became pregnant and giving birth to a baby girl in her cell for which there was no clothing available for the child. Mounting pressure prompted the legislature to petition Governor John C. Edwards to pardon her. During an episode of Who Do You Think You Are? it was discovered that Cynthia Nixon is a direct descendant of Martha Casto. The large picture displayed here was taken in the 1930s and it shows inmates in the prison yard, and if you look carefully, 
you'll see how the buddy system was an integral part of prison life. Under this system, somebody had your back and the favor was expected to be returned. The, this building depicted on the left-hand side was Housing Unit 4, or A Hall, as, and was built in 1868 and originally used to house Civil War deserters. A form of punishment known as the Auburn System, also called the Silence System, was utilized here where inmates were subjected to various punishments for infractions. If an inmate exited their cell and spoke to a guard or fellow inmate without permission, they were subjected to waterboarding or lashed with a cat and nine tails and thrown into dungeon cells afterwards. This system was abolished in the 1930s when cells were modernized with plumbing and electricity. The cell doors were only about five feet tall, so inmates had to duck as they exited their cells, which automatically put them in a subservient bodily position, another technique to instill a sense of inferiority within inmates. In the 1980s, this dorm was transformed into an honor dorm where inmates had more liberties and privileges, which included their cell doors being open all day, being closed only at night, and the inmates had access to pool tables. An inmate's record had to be free of all violations for two years to get their name on the waiting list. The building featured on the right-hand side here was, how, was used for housing and death row inmates and those subjected to solitary confinement. Many federal female prisoners were sent to the Missouri State Penitentiary simply because there were no designated facilities for females at that time. And the most common crime included immigration violations. In 1861, a, spe a facility specifically designed for women was constructed that included two stories housing inmates, a hospital, workshop, and a matron's room. And just to give you an idea on the size of these cells, this is me standing in one of the doorways and I'm about six foot two. So this was clearly not designed for tall people. And this slide right here shows just a couple of more pictures of the, uh, the women's um, facilities. I took this first picture just before descending to the solitary confinement area below. And where I am standing is directly against a wall of cell doors. Now, when I first noticed there were people standing on either side of me, and after I placed my phone in my pocket, I began feeling a tapping on the back of my hand. I thought it was somebody playing a joke on me, but when I looked around me, I discovered that not only were the two people who were initially beside me gone, but there was nobody behind me, as it is a restricted area. This picture shows the stairwell leading to solitary confinement, and this is one area where I became very nauseous and developed a massive headache, only to have both of these symptoms dissipate upon leaving the area. In this area, all of the lights were turned out and paranormal equipment was utilized. Our guide asked if any spirits were present, and many of us all of a sudden began hearing a low rumbling growl that seemed to materialize out of nowhere. It did not take us long to realize that we were not welcome and we quickly left the area. Many uh, residents that live close to, uh, to this facility report seeing orbs, uh, visitors report being touched by unseen hands, uh, phantom laughing seems to be a common occurrence, cell doors will slam, shadows, mist, cold spots, and odd sounds are all very common occurrences. This is one of the solitary confinement cells, many of which are open to explore. I would like to tell one story uh, told by our guide in regards to doors that are open or closed. At the beginning of the tour, we were all told that open doors need to remain open 
And the same notion applies to closed doors. Our guide said that sometime this year, a customer went into a cell and closed the door behind them. The door locked, necessitating a call to a locksmith on a Sunday night as well as to the manager. It took seven hours to free this individual and cost them about $700, and which they were responsible for. So if you are visiting, here, please remember that. The deadliest riot at Missouri State Penitentiary occurred on September 22, 1954, when Don DeLapp, an inmate in maximum security, overpowered guards, stole their keys, and began releasing other inmates as he and, and these inmates headed for the main compound. Very quickly, this mob entered buildings, inflicting unbelievable damage and setting everything possible on fire. By midnight, hundreds of law enforcement officers from the Missouri State Highway Patrol, police from Kansas City, St. Louis, and Jefferson City had been brought in, and the National Guard had been mobilized. The National, the Missouri, pardon me, the Missouri State Highway Patrol was summoned and every available officer was ordered to report to the prison for immediate duty. Local police departments cleared highways to allow quick passage of patrol cars, which often included convoys of 10 to 15 cars, with one re patrolman reporting that he traveled from Kansas City to Jefferson City, a distance of over 150 miles in just over an hour. Negotiations between Governor Donnelly, who told the representative of the prisoners that no negotiations were going to take place until the guards were released and all prisoners were back in their cells. The prisoners' representative's response was, no deal. And Governor Donnelly then stated, if you harm the hair on the head of one of those guards, we will kill the whole bunch. During this riot, one of the guards was discovered by a group of sympathetic inmates who disguised him in, in prisoner's clothing and led him to the entrance. By morning, all of the guards were safely accounted for. The riot lasted overnight and over 2,000 prisoners set four buildings on fire. The next day, 245 Missouri State Troopers entered the prison to break up the riot with speakers blaring orders for inmates to return to cells. One inmate ignored the warning and was promptly shot and immediately afterwards, all inmates entered cells with law enforcement closing the doors behind them. At the end of the 15 hour long riot, four inmates had been killed with 50 others injured and one had attempted suicide. Four officers were injured, several buildings were set on fire and many of them gutted, and the estimated price tag of the damage was $5 million. One of the inmates that was killed was Walter Lee Donnell, who had turned state's evidence against DeLapp, the instigator of the riot, and others. Seven men were indicted for his murder. Now here I feel the need to provide a disclaimer. The next several slides are going to um, have some uncomfortable content possibly for this, they, these slides rather pertain to when Missouri utilized the gas chamber as its method of capital punishment. The gas chamber was instructed in 1937 by inmates from stone harvested from the prison quarry. The chamber itself was delivered and set on a concrete pad with the building constructed around it and 40 executions took place here until the site for executions in Missouri was moved to Potosi in 1989. Prisoners constructed the specifically built building in the shape of a cross and the gas had to be contained due to its extremely hazardous nature. At the front of the building, there are two entrances. The door on the left was for prison officials and witnesses, while the door on the right was for the condemned inmate. The chemical used for years was cyanide gas, where two tablets were dropped into a bucket of sulfuric acid, creating the poisonous gas and special precautions had to be taken. Within this building, nicknamed the Death House, there is a single solitary cell in which the condemned prisoner spends their moments, which could equal days, and sometimes could be a week, 
and where they could visit with family and friends during this time. 42 executions took place in this building, most during the 1930s and 40s, with only two occurring in the 60s. This picture here shows the door to the gas chamber unit itself. And it's, just, it's massive construction was specifically designed to be airtight so that poisonous gas could not escape. The windows that you see within are viewed or are used rather to for people to witness these executions. And the benches or the bleachers rather that you see here, these are for, um, during that time, uh, witnesses to the execution, which often included victims' families as well, excuse me, as prison staff and anyone else gathered there that day. Now, these are two pictures of the chamber itself, and you will notice that there are two chairs for twice two inmates were executed simultaneously. The first double execution involved John Brown and William Wright on March the 4th, 1938, both having sentenced for murder. The second double execution will be discussed in a moment. Once an execution was completed, the gas was ventured into the atmosphere for 20 minutes before the chamber itself was safe enough for the body to be removed. And ammonia had to be applied throughout the chamber and to neutralize the gas, which would have saturated the prisoner's clothing. There are two levers seen here. The red one is to drop the pills into the chamber, seen in the right here. And the other one is to uh, used as part of the ceiling vents. Directly behind the levers, there are two switches, and upon zooming in, one can see that they control fans as part of the deionizing process during the execution. This gas was extremely hazardous, so several precautions had to be taken before, during, and after the execution. The plastic tube rising in the center of the roof is to release the neutralized gas into the air after an execution was completed. As a precaution, it was mandatory that the guard tower nearest the chamber seen here, as well as residents of nearby houses, were evacuated during executions to avoid them becoming ill from the escaping gas. These evacuations could last several hours. The cell featured on the left-hand side of the screen was where the condemned would spend their final moments before their death sentences were carried out. And usually an inmate would spend very little time in here, but sometimes it could equate to days you know, or, in certain circumstances, a week. The phone scene here would ring if a stay of execution had been granted, and the only people who had access to this phone number was the governor's office. It rang very few times. Here one sees a board of all 39 men and one woman that were executed within this chamber. And there are four individuals that I would like to point out. On the fourth row down, third from the left, is Claude McGee, who was sentenced to death for murdering a fellow inmate with a hammer in 1948 and was executed in 1951 where he requested a final meal but did not eat it, simply stating, I'm saving it for later. On the same row, the last two pictures on the right are Bonnie B. Heady and Carl Austin Hall. Heady was a prostitute from Kansas City who met Hall and became completely infatuated with him. In 1953, Hall convinced Heady to aid him in a kidnapping scheme. Initially reluctant, Heady eventually agreed and Hall chose Bobby Greenlease, the son of a successful Kansas City car dealer, as their target. Heady abducted Bobby Greenlease on September 28, 1953, after convincing administrators from his school that she was his aunt. 
Greenlees was immediately murdered and buried in a shallow grave, and the ransom demand of $600,000 paid in $20 bills was delivered. After acquiring the cash, Hall panicked, broke up with Heedy, leaving her in a hotel room in St. Louis, and he began spending extravagantly. When a cab driver spoke to St. Louis police officers who quickly arrested Hall with only half of the original ransom amount being recovered. The other half remains unaccounted for to this day. Hall and Heedy were sentenced to death, neither appealed their sentences, and were executed on December 18, 1953, side by side. The time elapsing from crime to the moment of execution was 83 days. On the far right at the bottom row is George Mercer. Missouri re-engaged its death penalty on, December, or on May 26, 1977, and the first person executed was George Tiny Mercer, who had been convicted of kidnapping, sexually assaulting, and murdering waitress Karen Keaton. As the chamber had not been used for several years, it had to be inspected, and it was determined that leaks were likely. likely. So lethal injection was chosen as the execution method. For Mercer's execution, the original chairs were removed and a gurney installed in its place. Mercer was pronounced dead at 12.09 a.m. and his was the last execution to take place at this facility until executions were moved to the facility in Potosi. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of the picture, you will notice a mirror. This was installed so that Mercer could see his wife, who he had married during his sentence and visited him frequently as the lethal injection was carried out. I wanted to conclude this travelogue with a picture of me sitting in the gas chamber unit itself, where I assure you I did not stay very long. I would like to thank you for joining me on this month's travelogue, and if you happen to be in Jefferson City, I would like to highly encourage you to visit this facility. They offer various types of tours, and it is certainly well worth seeing. Thank you for joining me, and until next time.